Welcome to the Foundations Business Program. I'm Courtney Shane, actor and fellow SAG AFTRA member. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Ty, Chris, and Lydia. Yay! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi there. Hi. All right. Hey so, hi. So, let's get started with a fun question. Then after this fun question, I have some questions for the three of you. And then we'll go to our audience questions. So first things first, I would love to know in your journey in this digital artistic creative path in having either clients or customers or starting a business in this area, can you share something with a, within a sentence or two of something that impacted you deeply and greatly and kept you motivated to continue doing what you do? And whomever wants to go first. Okay, awesome. I can jump in first. So nice to meet you guys. Nice to meet everyone on this call. So, okay, a little backstory on why this was an important moment for me. Um, I was born and raised in Greece before moving to the US for college and then staying afterwards for work. Uh, so I have kind of a soft spot for people who are looking to expand from Europe to the U.S. or from other countries to the U.S. So I feel like for me, a moment that really impacted me and made me keep going was when I was able to help a client actually do the same thing, but on the talent side. Love it. Thank you for sharing. All right. Who's ready? Ty, Chris? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, um <laughs> um, I would say that most of my clients I've worked with for several years, um, five, six years at, at some point, and um, just seeing them, I, it's not one moment, it's just many moments, seeing them put a lot of effort, energy, time into the craft, um, whether it's acting or across a, a big brand campaign they're into, and seeing that happen for them, getting that call that they they made it or they're getting it or they nailed that call back and it's, it's happening. Um, that's the best call to make. And it's so much fun. It's so rewarding. And, and I get emotional as they get emotional seeing, you know, that five, six year journey into that process happen for them. It's, it's the best. So it's not one moment. This is every time I get to make that call. It's the best part of my week for sure. Love it. Love it. Chris. I think I'd, uh, to piggyback on what Ty is saying, um, many moments, but it's really with clients, a level of trust, uh, so much of this business, when you work with a representative or someone that is there to champion you, you're, uh, it's a very vulnerable place to be. And we understand that, or for most reps, we understand that. But what's also vulnerable is to be the ultimate hype man in helping you fulfill your dreams and help you create and craft your own journey. And so with that, uh, what keeps me motivated or what keeps me going is a sheer undeniable sense of trust with my clients. Uh, when going on into the great beyond and not feeling like it's constantly either money driven or uh, motive, like just trusting that there is a meaning to the madness and being willing to jump off the ledge with you versus ever having a moment of second guessing. I love that. Thank you, all three of you, for sharing uh, this deep perspective on what keeps you going. Uh, so I have five questions that I have personally come up with myself. And I'm coming from the perspective of being an artist myself, having been in the business for a long time as an actor, not just as a union member, but also from the perspective of social media, digital art, being in that space as well. So I'm ex very excited to be able to ask these questions. All right, here we go. So my first question is, how does an artist target an agent for influencer slash social media talent representation? And is there a minimum number of followers or subscribers or brand deals that one must already have in place before being considered to be repped? And then how do you find that talent for your roster? So targeting you and how you find the talent, whomever wants to go first. Stop looking for representation. Focus on your brand and focus on you. Be as undeniable as you can be and make the agents and the managers chase you. I know that sounds very lofty to say, but it is the 100% truth. 
you don't want to go uh you've already lost the battle of the game that is making sure that your brand is at the highest because you're asking someone else to believe in you versus them chasing and coming to you to say i believe in you please let me work for you yeah i agree with that and i think that um you know i often get asked what's the minimum subscriber count or what's the followers or what what does it take and it, it really there is no number that is the magic number there's no silver bullet that is okay now you're ready or able it's about making great content and things that people really care about and and to the question of how we find talent we're on these platforms i'm looking i'm watching the new shows and new new television and new movies and seeing that but i'm also on tiktok and instagram and YouTube and seeing who really has a creative, unique voice, who's saying something special and different. To me, that's what gets me excited is someone that is really doing something that isn't just following a trend or following what five other people have done that I've seen that same day. Who's got something to say that's really unique and passionate and exciting. And for me, that's that can be a person with just a few thousand followers that's just getting started or someone that's got tens of millions. It really is about being authentic, being cool, being innovative. And I think for me, that's what gets me excited. It makes me look for a talent and go, oh, that's someone I'd like to work with or explore that conversation with at least. So embracing that creativity and a, and a great message. Yeah, definitely. Love it. Yeah, Love it. Lydia. And to add on to what Ty said, there's not right or wrong recipe. You know, like, like Ty said, you have to be authentic and really like stick to your own brand and know what works for you and what doesn't. And I feel like a big part of our business is looking at people who have longevity when it comes to their career. You know, anybody can make like the 15 minutes of fame that we're talking about, you know, make a viral video. Okay, that's great. How do you keep going after that moment? And that really has to do with personality as well. So for me, it's really important to actually get to know the person before I sign them to make sure, you know, that they are aligned with how I see their career and, you know, how things can progress in the future. Because in the end of the day, if you're not aligned and if you don't have mutual respect and, you know, mutual way of thinking with your client, it's going to be super hard down the line to make their dreams come true and also, you know, keep the relationship going. So I feel like trusting your gut and really getting to meet the person for who they really are is important when it comes to signing clients. Love it. Courtney, Thanks, if, I, if I can add to that, add sure. to it is, um, specifically around this conversation, I'd say social media should not be seen. Social media can be seen as a gateway to getting re representation. I know that we'll cater this combo to some degree specifically towards acting. I think what I would say is this. Social should only be seen as a way for you to buy back your power or to invest in yourself, to have power, to self-distribute your own content and stuff. You do that, you become undeniable. You have the get, you have the ability to charge the ticket for the view on your distribution. That's it. If you want to, if you have 15 million followers and people are watching you, you're undeniable. None of us can argue whether or not you should or should not because you've already proven that. Now, if you're trying to be, if you are wanting to be an Oscar-winning actor and you've gained 15 million followers for blending orange juice. It's a different story, but that brand and what you've done and what you've accumulated is is a brand in its own right. It might not be an actor in the original form of making 30 minute television series. Just identify what that brand is and seeing what your niche can be. I think you have to decide how you're breaking into the industry and then leveraging that to pivot into other arenas. You know, you bring up a really good point, and I think a lot of artists think about this as maybe a hobby that they really like doing is cooking, for instance, and they might start a cooking YouTube channel or something of that nature. And yes, a lot of personality would show in that YouTube channel about cooking, the entire channel is about cooking, but ultimately as an actor, they would like to be in an episodic, you know, drama or or something like that. So it's how does that kind of cross over when the content that they're creating either on TikTok or YouTube or whatever uh, platform is not particularly re related to something that is acting. So I'm going to go ahead and just transition right into that. And I'm curious what all of you have to say on that note, because Chris brings up a really good point. But I think having an audience is so valuable, especially in today's world in the media landscape and being able to capture that audience and take them with you from your cooking videos to your series regular on, you know, grown or whatever it is, like being able to port that audience to the book that you then sell when you go on tour, or when you're speaking at an event, 
all of that is super valuable, right? And being able to have that, that you've manufactured, that you created, that you cultivated is so important. And the best thing is that your audience feels the same way that you do about that. And they feel responsible partly for your success because they were with you from the beginning and they saw you get that audition that became that callback that became that role on that show. And I think that it doesn't really matter that your content is only about cooking because your audience cares about you as a person and a personality. And so they will pour with you to that project. If you cultivate it right, it's all good. I think the, the flip of that is making a cooking channel and having a great audience there. And then thinking that translates to casting directors or to care or to, you know, getting a role on something. It, it's not one-to-one, obviously. And you have to put the time and effort and energy into the craft of acting as you do in cooking to see success there. And I think to your icebreaker question to kind of bring it back for me is what I was saying in those five or six years, it's clients that put in the effort to go to the classes and drive to the West side at five o'clock in traffic to get that audition and seeing that process for years and years and years come to fruition with that offer, with that, with that role. That's what's exciting for me. That's what's great. And, and the audience just like me has been a part of that for those years and and will port with them in that project. So I think it's it's not one to one, but it kind of is in a unique way if you cultivate it and think about it the right way. And I think it ties back to what Chris said as well earlier about creating your own brand. People nowadays have to think of themselves as a brand, not just an actor, not just a singer, like it's a whole brand. So if you think about it, the majority of the A-list actors nowadays, since we were speaking about that, they all have their own lines of something, whether that's, you know, their own vineyard with their own wine line or it's their own beauty line. Everybody has an extra business attached to their main profession, let's say. So in order to create that business and sell products, you're monetizing your audience and your ticket sales and everything in between. So it's pretty much a 360 approach of how can we see an individual as a brand and a talent and create different sources of income and different sources of business for them. And in pre-social media platform days, I, the, it, singers did it all the time. They would, they'd would have a singing career and then all of a sudden they'd start acting. So there's some similarity there. Chris, were you about to say something? I was just going to say, I think a key thing that, again, not trying to speak for Ty and Lydia, but I know that we're all very confident. I know them fairly well to say, leaving this Zoom, there should not be 200 people leaving this and saying, oh man, I need to create an Instagram YouTube show or Instagram show or YouTube show or let me showcase my personality. A th- key question that I would ask everyone here because it's all comprised like it's show business, right? We all, I remember, listen, as someone that went to theater school way back when, uh, I would simply say it is a business and we have to remind ourselves of how that business has evolved over the course of many years from the way, way back during vaudeville all the way to now where we are. Uh, hopefully everyone in the audience has a cell phone or, or has some level of that technology. I would, I would challenge everyone to look at their own consumption habits. How much time are you spending on your phone versus how much time you're watching Netflix versus how much time you're watching a movie? Are you going to the theater? Think about how much that is. And if you're not going to the theater or if you're not paying for a theater ticket, ask yourself, well, if you're not, how many other people are not paying for that? Now, I'm not trying to like create a coup to suggest that the film business is dead. As a cinephile, love it all day. I'm just trying to challenge the way of thinking to say you have to follow where the money is. And if the, if you are using yourself as the consumer, think about that before you invest your time into something that you yourself are not doing. And then match that with your own creativity of what you're inspired to make and not, yeah. oh, I, I have to do this. Way to, way to yes, and that, Courtney, and not make yes. me a downer. Yes. yes, 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 inspiration. Okay, so that was question one and 1. 1.5. Okay, thank you, Chris, for that. Okay, um, number two, do agents that represent influencers slash social media talent also represent actors theatrically or commercially too? Or is your work completely focused on this quote unquote new space, right? Uh, do you expect actors to have agents for theatrical and commercial work also, or is it required to be repped across the board in uh, your agency or company? Whomever wants to go first. Uh, to answer the first part of your question, uh, I think it's a 360 approach. So, well, let's take it holistically. Within CAA, we always sign as teams. So if I sign a client that wants to act, I want to make sure that they have somebody on board from the theatrical side of things that can support that and get them out to auditions and can help them pursue that dream. 
Uh, so everybody that I point as a talent agent that wants to act definitely has somebody theatrically that can help them. But on the other side of things, because we work as teams, I'm on the teams of different actors and singers and everything in between as well to help them with their digital presence, whether that means, you know, an, an Instagram deal or it means, you know, the next thing to campaign that just like is an online campaign. Uh, I definitely help the traditional actors kind of cross over into that space and monetize their following in that way, too. So yes, on both sides of the spectrum. Yeah, and being at UTA, it's very similar. We sign across teams um, as well. And I think I'm a little bit unique because I started as a traditional talent agent. Uh, that was my path forward, representing actors for film and TV and talking to cast directors, doing that. And then probably five or six years ago, I made the transition to working more on the content creator side and digital side. So I still do a little bit of the, of the acting for clients, but by and large, every client at the agency has a full team of agents across all the divisions they want to be in, whether it's books, music, touring, comedy, acting, digital, all that. And um, we find that works really well because everyone's specialized in that one area, but united under the one team that knows kind of what's happening in the client's lives and knows their shared dreams and goals and how they all work together to, to get there. So to Lydia's point, yes to both. Great. Uh, any uh, two cents on that, Chris? Uh, no, no. I think okay. that the said it best. Sweet. Okay. All right. Question number three. How do the contracts work for this digital space? And how does it differ from commercial contracts, especially considering that a lot of the bookings for influencers are in the marketing commercial space? I'll start with that part. This is a dangerous question, Courtney. This is a dangerous <laughs> one. You're welcome. Uh, I, um, I would say, uh, uh, in a uh, all 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 media is colliding more than ever, and so I would say that I'm not going to go into the moniker to say all the deals are the same. No deal is the same. They have, you know, there is a rubric in which contracts fall into, uh, but there are uh, likeness clauses that can differ, meaning the exploitation of your likeness within a contract can look a little different uh, in a traditional media commercial landscape versus one that solely look to distribute uh, on Instagram. Uh, I think that what's happening more and more is that fortunately for, for fantastic creators in town out there, you have amazing agents like Ty and Lydia who are extremely well-versed and knowledgeable within those spaces and uh, have covered the gamut both in the traditional media uh, but also in what is considered new media. Um, the key point I would say is that as influencers participate, and I apologize for any SAG members that are in the audience, but given that this is the wild west, I would say that I predict and think uh, as someone that loves the union, that I think that there's a very difficult line that, that the talent and the members of the union have to ask themselves as it relates to being a talent, creating your own business on Instagram. And what that means, if you further over time, start to employ people under your umbrella. So if you're an individual, uh, I'll say it another way. If you're an individual that finds yourself incorporating yourself and say you have 12 employees, what happens when you are looking, uh, when your 12 employees want to be insured if you become the next Ellen DeGeneres of Instagram? Uh, that's a key question where I think there are no solutions for it yet. Uh, but I would say like, 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 when, uh, you know, do you go under your own insurance that you've now crafted for your incorporate, for your corporation? Are you an actor? Those are the key things that I think that will hopefully over time be fine tuned. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think, um, just to note too, I, I think someone just posted in the chat, but I know SAG has created this influencer agreement and side letter that um, is really helpful when kind of bridging the gap between talent in the space that historically was not union or didn't have a reason to go union because um, they weren't acting in a traditional sense or weren't in that world and still want to participate in these brand operations, these brand partnerships. Um, and I think it's a really good, it's a you know pretty nascent new resource, I would say, past couple of years. But I know that we have talent that are, that kind of fit in the SAG bucket that then will also play in opportunities of brands that may or may not be signatories and really does help kind of bridge the gap between the two and make it more streamlined um, in this more wild west scenario that we're living in. So I do think that it's evolving and it's exciting because of that. Uh, so I want to just kind of expand on this same question slightly. So 
if something came up that is definitely a contract for an actor in a commercial space, but then because of, let's say, let's give it an example, right? So let's say somebody books a national commercial that airs on television, but then there's an internet contract also that comes up. Do you guys negotiate that contract into the digital space and then work with the agent that does the commercial contract for the television space? Or do you negotiate everything? Like just kind of trying to uh, look into the your lives and what a day in the life of being in a digital agent looks like. Did that make sense? Yes. Yeah, I think it depends on how the deal. Yeah, I think it depends on how the deal starts. Usually, we have you know the entire scope of work ready for us when the brand or the buyer approaches us. So if there is an internet component and a traditional component, we would be aware of it. And again, as previously mentioned, we all work together. So whether it's us working with a commercial endorsements agent and the business affairs group to figure it out, we always make sure to stay connected within the team and with the company. So we don't cross any lines and we make sure everybody's just aligned for the best interest of our client. Yeah, I was going to make that point. It's a great point that that's why we work in teams and have our expertise in everyone's lane so that we do can we can come together on these campaigns that may morph into something much larger or more usage or exclusivities and being able to work hand in hand to figure out the best way to get through that deal, um, I think is what we're really good at and why we have teams. So, yes. Great. Great. Perfect. Exactly why I asked that. Thank you, guys. All right. So number four. What does a day in the life of your work look like so we as artists can understand your process better? And what are some of the favorite things that your clients do to support your process? Uh, try to do your best to, uh, don't wait for the phone to ring. Go out, like, your, uh, now more than ever, we're in a landscape where it's your job to be an entrepreneur. There was a great phrase, uh, uh, there was someone, uh, uh, someone had said, a mentor of mine had said previously, you know, the representative only takes 10%. It doesn't mean that they're supposed to be doing 10% of the work, but as it relates to you being out into the field and doing your work, uh, some people subscribe to the notion, and I think there's a, this idea of not being a part of social media. I would say uh, I, I respect those that are, are that say, I just want to act. I just want to find someone that will find me jobs to give me the ability to audition and go show up to work, go to set and, and check in, do my role, perform and walk away. But to go back to show business, unfortunately or fortunately, it's changed. We on social media now are expecting to have a response from Brad Pitt. Uh, when we see Bullet Train and we say, Brad, oh my God, I love your movie. You know, Kevin Hart and The Rock are the biggest pros of this is engaging with your community and keeping a one-to-one -one relationship where it's not a fan, you're a supporter. Uh, you're a viewer and you're an audience member that gets to have a proper relationship. So I'd say focusing on doing the work and allowing your representative to go off and give them the freedom to go do it and not micromanage. And updates, headshots, being consistent in reinvigorating and pivoting and keeping consistency and updating them with new information about your life. Yeah, I, I love this space, the content creator space, because the clients I work with are constantly telling me, hey, I'm going to go shoot this cool thing, or I've got this great opportunity I'm filming, or I've got this really big idea for this thing. It's not them waiting around for a script or an audition, which is fine. That's a different type of business. But I love that part because I get to be excited by their excitement and then take it out and go make something, put one and one together and make three because it's a, a great opportunity I see and some great value and something that's unique and fun. And I, I like those calls. And that's also to the relationship part, part that we keep referencing, these long-term relations we have where we are invested in the client's lives and their growth and their development. So for me, to answer your question at the beginning, my day is, every day is a new day. There's always something happening. It's always a different buyer, a different 
part of the business we're talking to because our clients in the space are so multifaceted or they are going on tour and releasing music and starting a stand-up show and acting and doing all these different areas. Plus the fact they're making great content on these platforms that we're talking to every day. Um, it's so varied that when I get a call from a talent being excited about an opportunity that they've created for themselves or they're going to create, that's a huge help for me to go and focus on that one area for them in the future with a great buyer, great opportunity as well. Yeah. And to kind of connect what Chris and Ty said, I feel like one of the most important things to be doing as talent, whether it's you're an actor or a content creator, is to create your own IP. Because in that way, somebody like myself or like Ty or like Chris can take that IP and sell it. That could mean, you know, writing your own book. It could mean selling your own TV show. It could mean going on tour, doing a podcast, whatever it might mean. Uh, IP is the most important thing nowadays. And I feel like, you know, people who are creative enough to go out there and shoot their own content every day with their friends, collaborate, just, you know, think outside of the box. It makes our lives so much easier because we already have great ideas to pitch and, you know, to monetize on. Thank you. All right. So question number five, what is the commission structure for your work? Are there residuals or are are all jobs a one-time fee? Are there a lot of buyouts or in perpetuity contracts in this space? I feel like it's a tricky one to answer. Because again, like we mentioned, every deal is so different from one another. You know, it could be a one of brand deal. It can be you know, creating your own line, which is like a licensing deal with like its own different royalty structure and everything in between. So I feel like that's a tricky question to answer. And I feel like all of us have seen a multitude of those different kinds of deals. Uh, but I feel like the most important thing that we all look out for is to have all the information up front and to really know what the buyer wants and what our client is comfortable with and kind of what they usually expect, which is how we like to call it, uh, to make sure we kind of, you know, reach the best solution and the best structure uh, for a specific deal, given that the client wants to do it. Yeah, exactly. There's some more one-off kind of shorter term deals that are pretty standard. And then there's these utilities point, there's these longer term investment opportunities or venture deals, licensing deals, you know, building products with their talent that take many, many years um, that have a whole different structure um, that comes with it. So it really kind of spends the gamut, which is great, I think, for the space. Um, but they are, everyone's a little bit different. But by and large, I think it's, it's, it's a lot of the kind of the branded work is kind of just a standard, you know, split that is, you know, normal and it's, it's kind of here and there. And sometimes there's longer deals, but there are these kind of fun, bigger projects that we get to work on. And that's a whole different structure, which is great to learn about and, and have clients participate in as well. I have a love hate relationship with this question. And I'd say this 10% across the board, 10%, it's the barometer. There are people and they're not on this call that go up or down or, or make a decision that it's gotta be more. I don't do that. I don't subscribe to it. Do your effing work. Uh, 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 that said, Ty is bringing up a phenomenal point that everyone needs to be aware of in the world and where we're evolving and what we're doing. Uh, entrepreneurship and enterprise business is something that the big three are further evaluating and investing in and participating in. And there is a huge, tremendous amount of sweat equity that goes into that work. And so uh, as... Uh, entrepreneurs and as builders of your craft and your brand, I would all, all I would love to admit or, 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 or to omit from my side or, or, or beg of all of you as you continue to grow and evolve is simply be fair. A lot these are people that are keep pouring sweat, the love, sweat and tears. I mean, as an uh, agent, I mean, I, I'm not one, but I, as someone that used to be one and supports them undeniably, I would say this, uh, uh, there are times where these agents don't get commissioned or don't get payment for helping you come up with a hair product idea that you run off and do yourself, but they've been running tooth and nail for uh, and have helped you craft and give you the support. Uh, there's no money in that in the very beginning. Ty saying it, it could take three, four years. Skinny margarita, uh, what is it? A skinny girl margarita is a perfect example of an experience that took uh, 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 a, a long time to craft and do, which eventually evolved into, you know, millions and millions of dollars, but there wasn't a commission structure to say, oh, I'm going to go get you a brand deal for 50 K there's my five. Uh, so anyway, just be fair. Uh, because sometimes I think people can get greedy and we just got to remind ourselves we're all in this together. 
we all don't, you know, maybe you need to be Elon Musk, but like, do you really, do you really? You know, Chris, you bring up something that I think is an important point that I've actually heard from artists that they say this all the time. What if you are that artist that did come up with that hair product and you, and you made a great series of videos around that hair product and it's doing well when you want to pitch something like a script for a brand new show is Hollywood really going to take this hair product viral person that seriously? Well, this is what another job for you, Chris, but I know we both, I just, I know Chris really well. Like we both lived this life for so long and Lydia too, I think, especially on the crossover side, you know, historically, it's been really hard and it's it's hard to make that jump. But I think people have kind of their mindset and their stigma of what a client is and what they see and how does that translate. And so I think that keep going back to your icebreaker, which is crazy, but like, I think this like multi, multiple year thing, it's because clients have spent years and years and years in those classes, in that process, perfecting their craft, competing against other people that aren't doing the uh, hair care line you're talking about or aren't having this other great opportunity. They're just, that's all they do is this thing. They come from a great drama school and they're just working really hard and that's all they do. But, you know, our talent has this amazing, they have that now because they spent years doing it. They also have like 10 million followers that will follow them. And so I think um, it's taken a lot of education. I think that the blending of social media, you know, it used to be, very much like a line, I would say, of like traditional and digital. And there wasn't a, a ton of crossing of the stream. It was just what it was. I think with the Netflix of the world and streamers and the fact that you have great giant celebrities that are on TikTok and TikTokers that are acting in films and TVs, like it's all becoming more of one. So it's helping. It's definitely helping. But I always say that you still have to have the skills to pay the bills. You still got to be able to go and win that audition. You know, we can, all of us three could open the door for someone in a casting office or with, you know, with a great brand or with a great opportunity, but the client's got to go in there and win it and go rock it. And we can't do that for them. It's up to, it's up to you guys, up to them to go do it. And so you have to do that. And that just comes down to being great at what you do, I think. So yes and no. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder, right? And to that, you can elevate that same notion to taste. No yeah. one talks, we, we all celebrate Tyler Perry. But no one talks about how that man really got going. And if you do know, phenomenal. But Tyler Perry galvanized. Uh, he, he he crafted. Uh, he first started out uh, uh, on the the Bible Belt, uh, crafting great stories, theater projects, and putting on those plays. And that evolved into making what uh, what is uh, film projects and bringing a community together to really love the sense of storytelling and really coming together around Tyler's stories. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not saying that I don't love Medea, but I don't think that I'm the guy that's staying up till 10 o'clock for the premiere. But there are a lot of people that are doing it. And the, the key question I would say is, why are they doing it? Um, all I, I, the only reason I, I'm mentioning it simply to say, uh, you know, Ty represents some fantastic people. Lydia does. I just want to argue that, you know, Charlie D'Amelio just got a nice big old fat deal at, at uh, Hulu for her show. Addison Ray uh, is now in an acting uh, deal at, U uh, at, uh, at Netflix. And, you know, I'm biased. I'm not going to lie. You know, my business partner, we just closed a nice big deal at Amazon. Uh, um, now, again, granted, it's starting and unscripted, but is a multifaceted deal that is geared towards TV and film. Um, uh, uh, and he's going to be the Gen Z star uh, of, of their sports network. So like the tides are changing. And I, that's why I just really poke at, it's not to talk about how well we're doing. It's just to talk about the landscape changing in terms of consumption habits and where people are really watching content and what they're watching. And one of the most amazing words out of everything you just said was evolution. And then just how fans that are fans of whomever that digital star is and being attached to their evolution of, of where they started and where they, where they are now, what are they creating now? Because they're a fan of them. I love yeah. that. Cause if you think about it, like 10, 12 years ago, like before vine, before everything like that, you know, all the young talent came from Disney and Nickelodeon. 
nowadays it comes from a multitude of places you know and digital media is one of the big ones and we see people like you know Liza Koshi kind of expanding and getting more into theatrical so back in the day there were less opportunities to do this and I feel like with the evolution that we're talking about it's just having more platforms more opportunities to do the same thing Okay, guys, so in the essence of time, let me get to some of these awesome questions that came through from this, uh, the Google Forms. All right, so very interesting, very first question from the audience. How does one become a digital agent? That is an interesting question. Um, Okay, so my background, when I first moved to LA from Greece, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was 17 years old. I was like, okay, I'm going to study business and I'll figure it out. And I don't know if it's manifestation. I don't know what you want to call it, but it just happened to meet this one actor who I was small talking with. And he was like, what do you want to do when you, know, when you graduate? And I said, I had no idea. And for some reason, he thought that I should meet his agent. And he introduced me to his agent, who um, was one of the bigger people in the world of young talent development and she kind of became like my second mom my fairy godmother and um i learned young talent development from her but again back in the day it was like you know disney channel nickelodeon all those kids and then when i entered caa i was in the mail room and i thought this is what i want to do like traditional tv or motion pictures and i kind of realized that young talent comes from digital nowadays more than it comes from the traditional route so that's kind of where it clicked for me and i was like okay this is where i want to go this is what i want to be doing so that was the moment where it changed for me and i decided i want to be a digital agent specifically and then work through the ranks all the fun you know mailroom days becoming an assistant becoming a coordinator agent trainee everything in between just putting in the hours putting in the work and really just loving what you do and really loving being an advocate for other people because in the end of the day we make other people's dreams come true. And if it's not something you're passionate about, you're not going to be loving your day in day at work. Yeah. And similar path for me, I was in the mailroom at UTA and worked my way up from there. And, um, you know, I, I referenced before I was on the talents, more traditional talent side of working with actors for film and TV and probably three or four years into that, I just saw this great opportunity and this great these clients that were becoming stars off of YouTube and Vine at the time and these other platforms. And there was such great, business around them and so exciting opportunities. And I thought it was great. And then a lot of them wanted to act. And so I was helping to kind of cross them over and get them auditions and be a part of that world. And then just over time, I just started signing more and more in that world and less in the traditional world. And I just fell in love with the space. Like I said earlier, I love that they were making great content and calling me with ideas and being really passionate about their world. And the market was just kind of shifting that way. And so I just kind of fell in love with it and moved more of my business to that side. And now just really do that. And I think it's fantastic. It's an amazing world to be in. And it's so fun for Lydia, myself and Chris to be on the cutting edge of all these conversations. It's a very new business. It's exciting and different. And every day there's a new buyer, a new opportunity, and it's not the same five, you know, networks or 10 studios or whatnot. It's always something exciting, fun and changing. I think that's what makes, at least for me, it makes my job so exciting. It's just that new, that new uh, ability, new opportunity every day. Love it. All right. I have a very interesting question. I am a pet creator slash influencer. Does all the advice you've given today also apply to my situation? If not, how is it different and how could having a digital talent representation uh, help me? I have plenty of offers to do sponsored posts, et cetera, for product, but I would like to move beyond that so I can keep the roof over myself and my pup. Thank you. I think the key question I would ask is what is moving beyond that? Now, I know we can't have like a one for one to one with the individual, but I would say uh, one, it totally applies. Uh, I think Ty knows this and, and Lydia knows this. My fiance at one point was a, an agent over at CA and represented Nala Cat, uh, <laughs> who, if you don't know, is one of the most prominent uh, 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 cat influencers in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there's a huge brand that can be built uh, that could be un unparalleled or, or parallel to that of like Hello Kitty if you craft it well enough. I, I don't know the types of deals that you're orchestrating or the types of brand deals you're doing, I guess it's really upon you to see, have the foresight to say, what is the story I'm trying to tell with your your cat or what does your cat, sim sorry, your, your dog, what, your, what does your pet symbolize? And what is the, the theme that actually will entice individuals to watch? I would say the brand deals you're closing, 
that's no different than broadcast television. I mean, that's that's what keeps the door. That that's what that's the business portion of of your business. So, if you're looking to eliminate that from what you're doing, I I, I would say stop. You're that you're you're killing what you're doing. Do more of it because that's the ad inventory, ad inventory that's affording you the ability to actually create your art. Um, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. Or, In or the helps, essence but. of time, I feel like I feel like you answered that one. So I'd love to go on to the, the next question. Can you give some examples of what you do with a new client with or without giving a name of a client? So like you're onboarding a client. What are like kind of the first steps that happen? I think it's um, so we really focus on the talent and what they want to focus on. It's hundred percent about what they want to do. So if they come to us and say, well, I really want to have a podcast. I've always wanted to do a podcast. I podcast is my number one thing. It's our goal then to go work on that podcast, to go get that idea spun up, get that out in the market and get it sold and then, and have a great success there. I think that um, there's all these other avenues of their business that to Chris's point, things to keep the lights on the brand opportunities and things that kind of churn. And so a lot of our work too, is to then educate the market that they're now a client of the agency and to tell our buyer, and our friends and our relationships that we're now working with this person and get them kind of up to speed on the great things they have going on and keep all that going. But at least for what we do, it really is about where the client wants to be going in that immediacy and jumping right on it. Then of course, it's also like the 5, 10, 15, 20 year goal of what they want to be doing and building and doing the proper steps to get there, which starts from day one. But I think it really is jumping in right from the start, a lot of passion around that area they want to focus on and then taking it head on and um, being able to then, you know, have the other areas activate around them as they come up. Mm -hmm. And then to add on to that, it's really important for us as well to connect with the other team members, whether it's a manager or it's a publicist or an attorney, to make sure we're all on the same page. Because I've had multiple people come to me and they're like, hey, I really want to go to the Chanel show at Fashion Week next year. And it's like, okay, great. That's amazing. That's your goal. How do we get there? And as agents, of course, we can like book, book the smaller deals to slowly get to that point. But if they did have a publicist that could secure them editorials and photo shoots and get them dressed with the right stylist and everything, that helps us get there in a faster and quicker way. So I feel like really knowing a person's goals and, you know, having that like mutual respect and being open-minded to really listen to advice about how you're going to get to the finish line. I think that's something that's super important to make clear from the get-go. Amazing. Okay. So the next one is I'm a part of a comedy duo and we've had a lot of companies asking us to create content We've found that most brands just want us to trade their product in exchange for creating content. Is there a way to get past that stage of branded content? I think it's part of the negotiation. You know, everybody's going to try to give you the least amount of money. And if they don't have to give you any money, they'll just be like, great, here's a glass, promote it. It's all about negotiating. You know what you're worth and know the value you bring to a brand, whether that means I have great engagement or it means I'm blowing up on Instagram or it means I make great content that you can reuse on your own platforms. Really knowing what sets you apart from the rest of your peers is what's going to give you the most negotiating power to go and get what you want. Yeah, there's a lot of power in no. I always say that. A lot of power in the word no. And I think being able to turn down something just because you know it's not the right fit and not financially make it doesn't make sense. I think there's there's a lot of strength in that, and I think that it does lead you to find the right opportunities that are yeses. Um, obviously, you know there's sometimes where it's an amazing brand that you're really passionate about, or you love the product, you use it every morning or whatnot. There's a great story behind it that makes sense. Why you do that? Maybe for free, maybe just to get it to get started and show the the mat the metrics and show the audience conversion and show all of that, which you can then go back and follow up and try to get money from that point uh, on the next one. But the reality is, I would say, just turn down the ones that that aren't adding value to you that you feel that way and, and only take ones that will and, and stand your ground to Liddy's point, negotiate for yourself, be an advocate for yourself and, you know, demand what you what you feel is right and fair. And eventually that will you know come to fruition, I feel like. But a lot, a lot of power now. And I think that's a, a good thing people can can learn from. Love it. All right. I'm going to go on to the next question. Is there a particular piece of content that you believe is a turn off? that would prevent talent from being signed and should be avoided? Being unauthentic, being, uh, 
unauthentic to your brand. An audience, an audience member knows. So if you're trying to craft something and you're pretending to be something you're completely not, and I don't mean from an acting perspective of like, you're not a fish or you're pretending to be a fish. I mean, like if you truly don't like ketchup, like don't pretend to like ketchup, like don't do it. The, we're not, we're going to obviously see that you don't. So like, don't do a ketchup commercial. It goes back to Ty's commentary about saying like the power of no, I truly mean it when an audience member knows when you're selling them a fake ad or you're, you're selling them an ad just because you wanted the money, but like you really were not thinking about them when it came to advertising uh, to them. Or, or can I just say one more, uh, if I may? Uh, or I would also say uh, not being willing to be vulnerable. That's more of an overbroad commentary that I have for all people in business. But I would say uh, uh, don't need to do with if I may curse, don't fucking peacock. I mean, I do a little bit. We all do. We have a little bit of fun, but be honest. We don't need fucking 50 million name drops. Be yourself. Be who you are. Be okay and be comfortable with not knowing something and asking for doing it. The best leaders do. The best leaders say, I'm not an expert in this field. I'd love to learn from this. Can you help me out? Do that. I mean, do you guys want to add to that or you feel pretty good about Sorry. it? Sorry. That was great. <laughs> that was, that was great motivated. I, I like it. I feel it. All right. Okay, so moving on. Uh, do you have any advice for artists reaching out to brands and companies that are pertinent to their niche? So, you know, then that way they've done that already. And then when the agent finds them, you know, they've already done that step. Hmm. I think there's value in having a client or someone that's passionate of a brand kind of like DMing the brand and saying like, Hey, I'm, I love your product. I use it. Or even when you, we have clients sometimes that will tag a brand organically if they use, you know, the product in the morning, if they use a, a certain serum or a certain get ready with me, you know, tool, um, just doing that and then kind of building a relation. I mean, obviously the, everyone wants to be connected to the talent as close as they can be. There's so, so much value in working directly with all of you, right. And having that one-on-one. -on -one. And so, you know, it's our job to kind of be the middleman and protect you guys and have a real point of view and understand the market really well, because we see it across all these people and all of our clients. Um, but I think there is a genuine, genuine, authentic connection that can be had from there. And if you genuinely have passion to Chris's point about being authentic, if you have a lot of authenticity in what you like and what you do, I think starting a conversation, just reaching out and by DMing and saying, Hey, I really love your product. I've been using it forever. If there's a story behind it, I think that's really helpful. If it comes directly from you, it's more powerful than if it just comes from me secondhand, you know? So I think that there really is, I, I think just being authentic and, and going forward, I think is really helpful too. hundred percent. Cause like on the other side of the spectrum, if you really want to just, you know, get more into beauty and you just email the same thing to like 200 different brands, people know, you know, it's the same thing for us. Like I'm sure Ty and Chris have gotten those emails that are just like, you know, they send them to like 20 CA agents, 20 UDA agents, 20 WME agents, the same email, just change the name, try and get a presentation. And the same thing happens with brands as well. And, you know, this industry is small. That's another thing. People talk, we all know each other and the word gets out there. So the more authentic you can be and the more <clears throat> selective you can be and actually staying true to yourself, the better it's going to turn out for you in the long run. Love it. Okay. So what protections are available for talent with brands and what recommendations are there on what to look out for before, during, and after securing a brand deal? This is such a broad question. That, that's mm -hmm. like saying, hey, can you help me negotiate my deal without, uh, tell me all the secrets to negotiating my deal so I don't need you. I'm joking when I say that. Uh, I so am joking when I say that. Um, own your likeness. I mean, every single one of these deals is all going to be about the exploitation or the exposure of your personal self. So if you have the leverage to suggest that you are in demand and don't want to have a brand like Target exploit you across so many different avenues, fantastic. You can say no to them. Uh, if you are in a national commercial and you got cast, and you really need the job and you think that you're replaceable by a bunch of others, maybe, you know, that's where SAG comes in. You have the SAG minimum. Uh, there it is. Look at me. 
uh, you have the SAG minimum to where a certain allotment will be, you at least are guaranteed a certain amount. And that's enough of a protection that you should feel comfortable knowing that the union has helped really craft that. So you know uh, what the minimum uh, uh, the minimum fee should be and would be for you. Mm -hmm. And there Sad are a lot... <laughs> And there are a lot of brands out there nowadays, like, you know, even myself, I get outreach for clients all the time that I'm like, wait, I've never seen this brand before. Kind of doing your homework and really looking into it. Like, who else have they worked with? Are they a legit company or am I just going to post about their leggings and then nobody's going to pay me? They're going to disappear. The email bounces back. Really just like doing, you know, your homework and knowing what you're looking for and who you're speaking with. It can be as easy as like, hey, let's jump on a phone call to make sure this is an actual person and I can communicate with them and make sure, you know, it all plays out. But really just like being mindful of your own business and looking into it before you say yes, I feel like is super as well, especially in the early stages. Awesome. Okay. Uh, if we are already working as content creators, how do we approach getting our brand deals to agree to sign the new SAG AFTRA influencer contract? This is where I phone the phone the audience and get Shane to hop on in where I love it. <laughs> Help us walk it through. Um, but I, I know there's a variety of ways in which that the client can, you know, pay into the union through the influencer agreement, and the side letter. If it's if it's a you know a non SAG project, and if it is SAG, I know that obviously there's this, the signatory will, you know, be a part of it and pay into the union the dues. So I think that there are I think that resource that was sent is probably the best to read and learn about. I think it's really helpful and kind of under you know lays the roadmap for where uh, funds are paid and how that process works. Asked and answered. <laughs> right. Don't do that. I think you covered us. Okay. Love it. Okay. So, all right. Actually, I mean, more, actually, go actually can I do it? I'll, I'll die do on the sword. Do it. I think it's very, I, I think that we're in the Wild West, and that's that's why. I mean, that they, there are relationships where there are a lot of commercial agencies or ad agencies that are taking on that business. I mean, that's a very, you should go to the the resource and use that. I think that unfortunately, just to be very candid and I'll just give a, I think that business is changing and is still evolving. So if I'm giving you a real human answer, the business is evolving. And sometimes you're not gonna, you're gonna lose a job because the brand is not going to, is not willing at that time to pay the additional cost and are specifically looking for a non-union situation, sadly. Um, that's just me just giving the real. I've experienced it with a lot of clients sometimes where we've actually had to lose jobs because of it, sadly. Okay, so I'm gonna shift into age real quick because I know that there's a lot of folks that feel it's too late for me, I'm I'm too old, you know, and people get caught up in, in sort of that. So what's what percentage would you say are over 35, over 40? Does age really matter? Should they just let go of that thinking? I don't think it matters because at the end of the day, you know, there is consumers and customers of all age groups. So it really depends what you're trying to sell and what you're trying to be. And I feel like in every single industry, like I'll take fashion as an example, just because I know it best, you know, everybody buys clothes, everybody buys makeup, everybody buys everything. So everybody wants to have a role model to look up to. So I don't think there is ever an age limit. No, definitely not. I've yeah. worked with clients, not to cut you off, sorry, but I've worked with clients that in clients in their 80 year old grandmothers and, you know, clients in their brand new, you know, two year old, one year, three year old babies, right? It's it, There's no um, real age gap or, or disparity or, or any of that. I think it really is just about making, we keep saying this, but make great content. If the content's great and people like it, that's all that matters. Um, this is, I, I, I want to tackle it. I want to acknowledge that um, Ty, Lydia, and myself are younger individuals giving that advice for those that might be in the audience. If you're looking for an excuse to not put yourself up there and be vulnerable, that's your decision and that's your choice. If you're here, it's because you're looking for a way to further build your craft or find ways to build your business. And if you haven't tried, then you're only robbing yourself of that opportunity. There are plenty of actors. I mean, we mentioned Betty White, but like, I, I know I could pull a list. Les Leslie, uh, what's Leslie's last name? Leslie Jones is a perfect example of someone who literally like, like recreated his entire career 
uh, 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 later in age and is like the most phenomenal favorite on Ellen uh, during that time. So like, I just, I, I just, there are like 50 comps I know that I can find uh, to help reinvigorate and showcase that those are people that found and crafted content um, uh, to reinvigorate their, themselves to a broader four quadrant audience. I'm going to transition right into this. And I basically have read, you know, a lot of these questions. I'm going to take about five or six of them and lump them together because I can see that there's some consistency here. It's it's difficult because what you guys do isn't really to educate somebody on how to gain followers and how to create content and how to do those things. But if you were to give any advice generally in this space, of where to start or or sort of getting somebody to go in that direction. Obviously there's that inspiration within, right? Of what you wanna create and being true to yourself and coming back to that authenticity. But are there any resources or tips that you guys would be willing to give in this space to our audience that haven't started creating content yet? I think consistency is one of the most important things. So if you, let's say you start a YouTube channel, think about it as a TV series, you know, the same way you clock in every Thursday at 9 p.m. to watch your favorite show, the same way you should be uploading as well. So think about yourself as a mini studio and how you want to be creating content and making sure you keep having your audience engaged and coming back for more and more. So I feel like consistency is the number one thing when it comes to starting and really, you know, succeeding in the end. Yeah, that's a really important point. I think you won't grow unless you're being consistent and having a consistent plan and consistent content. I think also just being a connoisseur and being a consumer of the content, like watch watch what's in out there, watch YouTube, check out TikTok, be a part of the, the creator economy, like learn kind of the players and what's in the space and like really dive into it. It's like, if you want to be an actor, you obviously have a lot of comps and directors and shows you like and other actresses and their performances. It doesn't mean you're going to go copy them one to one and make a, a clone of what someone else is doing. It just means that you're going to be inspired or take away or see an editing style that you think is really fascinating that you want to incorporate into your own content. So just be a part of the ecosystem that's being created here and really dive into it. And to continue on this front, obviously a lot of people that have been creating content and, and not shy about it, but there are people that are older that are resisting to it because they've maybe been a working actor for a really long time. And, and the, the times have changed. So in, is there any tips in terms of embracing this new world and make it less overwhelming and daunting because they really do want to get on the social media platforms and create content and put stuff out there? Any words of encouragement around that so that they can take their content and put it out there, even though they're kind of afraid of it? I feel like collaborating with other talent makes it a little easier, like knowing that you have a support system and a peer that wants to do the same thing and you guys are working on it together. I feel like it makes it less scary. Like, you know, I'm not talking about content houses or like, you know, actually going and making a big thing out of it, but like really just having peers that you can talk to and create content together and really just like, you know, be able to be yourself with and open up with. I feel like that's what's going to make you uh, less stressed and less anxious about how it's all going to turn out. Yeah, I would, I would say, let's look at a different approach. Let's find our stakes or find our why. Let's say if we're starting at the 80s, you know, there wasn't uh, video recorders, I can't imagine, or really you were, you were putting yourself on tape as much back in those days if you were around auditioning during that time. It was very much taking, taking off, the, the, off the idea, the, the voice of the acting, uh, of the casting director, right? But technology has evolved increasingly decade over decade to where at one point it was starting to put myself on tape. I mean, that wasn't something that was going on in the 90s. We didn't have cell phones that, where everyone was put doing that. I would say change your mindset to suggest that perhaps this format is more of a scripted, maybe it's you putting yourself on tape and, and, and uh, uh, forcing yourself to consistently audition in a new way. Perhaps you create a hyper-realized version of yourself and use it as a character that you can sit consistently visit that lives in a world uh, of cooking or lives in a world of unboxing technology. What is the stakes of that person? How do they live in a world? And perhaps 
then you have someone that you've done a character study on and it's a scripted format that you can then really further dive into and do a character study and write a script about it. It's yeah, to that stuff. point, the way I look at it too, Chris, I think is that it's it's like you're making mini pilots. Every time you upload a, con- a piece of content, it's like a mini pilot and you get an, an instant reaction from an audience, whether they liked it or not, what they didn't like. You see these comments come in and that can be daunting and challenging too. You have to have you know some thick skin around that process, but um, you do get feedback right away and you can pivot. The next time you launch the episode or you know, I'm making a, a, a comp here, but you launch a piece of content, you can do it differently. You're just changing it different and you kind of get that instant feedback every time you put up. It's not permanent, right? It's something that you can change and more if it's malleable. And I think that's what's exciting about the space is that you create what you put out there and you get that instant feedback hit of, oh, this is working. It's not working. Let me pivot. Let me do this. And I think that's really important. So I would say that's part of the process too, is when you create this world, you create these characters, just do it, just try. And then take that feedback in, take it to heart, the stuff that matters that actually is productive and, and constructive and, uh, and, and roll with it and make, and make changes. And you know what? If you don't get any views, you just fucking crafted three new shots for your, for, for your reel. Just make sure that it's great content yeah, true. and you wrote it yourself, you know, mindset. And if you're proud of what you put out, you made something great and you put it out there. That's, that's, you know, that's what it is. And eventually someone will see it and love it and, you know, have the same process you did. So. I love this. Okay. This is going to be the very last thing I in once again, in reading ahead in a lot of these questions, I'm going to take about seven or eight and lop them together because really they have the same theme. And the overarching concern as a as an actor or as a director that's wanting to create content on social media platforms, but it's not specific to directing or they, or they want to make something that is specific to acting or directing, but it doesn't take off the way that maybe a cooking channel would or doing, you know, uh, like stunts or something like that, that would work on a social media channel, channel, right? So those go viral, but scenes of a web series doesn't go viral. So how do you find the space where you can create content that does get attention, but can be taken serious, serious for like acting or directing opportunities? Did that kind of make sense? Stop finding excuses to not do it. If you, if, uh, and, and which sounds very harsh and mean. Awkward black girl, UTA client, Issa Rae. You've taken all it. my examples. You want to, you can run with it. <laughs> no, you go for it. You go for it. I, Issa Rae. I, 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 two more. So go, go for it. <laughs> Issa Rae crafted a phenomenal uh, YouTube video or YouTube series again, like we can talk about high maintenance. So there, there's, there's, there's plenty of, of examples to be given to where like people put content out and, and I tell you, they didn't get a bunch of videos or sorry, you get a bunch of views. Awkward black girl did. It got like hundreds of thousands, which was good at that time. But like go on Vimeo Vimeo when Vimeo first started out was a bunch of ways in which a director would put something out. I get it. Yeah. Don't look at saying, Oh, it's not f- meant for this space. If people want to watch it and they're connecting with it, they're going to gravitate towards it. Now, if you're going to do something inside baseball and you're going to do like a another, hey, a cast of actors are all 20 something year olds and trying to figure out life and audition and get into Hollywood. Well, like, I'm sorry, Entourage is not going to happen anymore. Like, don't don't try to recreate a project that already happened. You know, I know that's very hard to say and harsh criticism, but like if if the story's already been told. It's our job to figure out a new way into that gate to where we can, uh, you know, make people want to watch it. Right. Go with that. Yeah. Three, 10 more examples. No, I mean, just just a, I mean, just a few I'm thinking of that, you know, probably started in the space that weren't directly one to one comps, you know, from some UTA clients, Bo Burnham being a great one of someone that was making really funny YouTube videos, but, you know, goes on to then direct eighth grade, which is an amazing film that is so different than what I think people would have seen him for on his original old school YouTube videos. Aquafina is another great client of ours that similarly had some great funny content online, but now is, you know, obviously acting in these award-winning movies and TV shows. And I, I think there's, you know, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, another great example of a client that had an online presence and an online series and then creates Fleabag. There's so many great um, examples I can think of in recent history that 
aren't one-to-one -one comps of I'm doing this one thing on social and then it becomes this other thing elsewhere. It can be like Issa with Awkward Black Girl that became Insecure. That's very similar. But beyond that, she's doing so much more than that now. And that's so exciting because I think it's a personality game too. And so whatever I would say too, to answer your question about, well, how do I do that if it's not one-to-one? -one? Infuse your personality into what you're doing. People spark to who you are as a person. We're all humans. We all want to connect. During the pandemic, we weren't connecting as much. You know, now think of who we are a little bit more. But I think that we we want that. We all need that. And that's why we watch movies, watch TV. We want to see ourselves in the screen or or our history or our, our heritage what we're doing. And I think it's it's so pat to Lydia's point of why what what she likes about her clients when she makes this, this jump from you know Europe to the U.S. and whatnot. I think that there's something there. And so whenever I watch somebody or look at somebody's content, I I may not see exactly what they see for their path, but I will see something in them that I love, the spark, this this personality, this this creativity. And I go, oh, let's let's work with that. Let's go figure that out and find some opportunities. So I think that's how I would say is like don't limit yourself and think, oh, because I'm only doing this, it's not exactly what I want to be doing in this, or it's not one to one. That's okay. As long as you are authentic and genuine and yourself in these videos, we're going to see that. We're going to think it's really cool potentially. And that could be something that's really fun and exciting for everybody. So just remember it's show business. If you're a college student on this right now, or not to be aged, like if any age, think about where people are currently congregating. If, but I will just say, if you're a college student, you are missing the huge game. You have 40,000 people within one area. It takes three seconds to go walk around that campus and say, hey, tune into my show tonight. Or hey, hand out flyers, be smart marketers, be a guerrilla marketer and think about how, if, if, if the old school way of thinking as a comedian is how do I get butts and seats as a, or, or a promoter, how do I get people to a venue? You should be thinking, how do I get people to watch my content? It doesn't mean just post it on there. Really go be active. COVID has gone. It's not gone, but I just mean like we're all out into the world. God, that's going to be a clip later on in life. <laughs> no, and I think it all brings us back to your first question, Courtney, about what we look for when it comes to new talent. Exactly. Circling around. And it's really the star quality, which none of us can really define. We can't say A, B, C, here are the bullet points of what it means. It's just the feeling we get from somebody, which is everything we just discussed with authenticity, creating IP and everything in between. It's really just you know, what, what does star quality mean for you and how do you play around and show business to make sure other people know who your true self is? I feel like that's what stands out the most. And that's what all of us are looking for. All three of you. Thank you so much. This was absolutely delightful and exciting and inspiring and right to the point. And we all really, really, really appreciate this. We hope to have you back again sometime and this audience is so lucky to have had you. So thank you. Thank you, of course. Thank you. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. <laughs>